Sakaguchi's side project sliding into the ninth slot, the original successor to Final Fantasy VIII was pushed to the PlayStation 2, which launched three months before 9 in Japan. Eager to take full advantage of improved technology, Square spent $32 million on its next project, assembling the talents of over a hundred writers, coders, and artists. Most of the earlier fantasies focused on a European style of architecture and topography, with 7 and 8 weaving in elements of modern technology and Japanese steampunk. When growing its new world, Square sought influence from the islands of Southeast Asia, specifically near the regions of Thailand and the South Pacific. Water would play a dominant role in the setting and story of Spira, a sun-drenched paradise with beauty gamers had never experienced. Final Fantasy X was released in Japan on July 19, 2001. It washed up on our shores just in time for Christmas. It was directed by Motomu Toriyama, who had worked as an event planner on 7 and 8. Katase and Sakaguchi supervised via producer roles. Tetsuya Nomura returned to design the characters, and Nobuo Uematsu composed his 10th series score, but received additional assistance for the first time. The story began and ended in Xanarkand, a tropic metropolis unaware of its imminent destruction. Titus, a professional blitzball athlete, was barely saved from the massacre by his mentor, Oren. The two warped to the world of Spira, where Titus learned the city he called home had been destroyed a thousand years earlier. His quest for answers led him to discover an ancient pilgrimage that would shake the ground of his very existence. This fish-out-of-water tale was unconventional for the franchise. As an outsider, Titus learned everything that was known about Spira directly without any need for creative exposition. The story also stood out by establishing a clear geographic endpoint fairly early on in the narrative, unfolding its secrets as you trekked along the path toward its unavoidable conclusion. This prophetic journey's aim was to guide and protect the summoner Yuna, a caller of sacred spirits now called Aeons, whose power came from human souls called Faith. Yuna's multiple guardians included Waka, a beach-bound blitzball captain, Kimari, a Ronso outcast of few words, Lulu, an unforgiving black mage, and Riku, a spunky teenage thief who was Titus' first contact with Inspira. The in-game character models were pleasantly detailed with facial expressions their predecessors only dreamed of. But their colorful attitudes were defined by another franchise breakthrough. Quiet! Voice acting. You have profaned and subverted a thousand-year-old tradition. Do you realize what you've done? Their dialogue was penned by Kazushige Nojima, who also wrote Final Fantasy VII and VIII. Not every line was spoken as subtitles were used for minor non-playable characters, but the central heroes and villains were all cast with both English and Japanese voice actors bringing their vocal cords to life. <laughs> the inclusion created numerous development hiccups, such as characters' lips mouthing one language but speaking another. Take your time. But the addition was an ambitious and crucial step forward. A priest and maester named Seymour Guado went against the beliefs of his nation and his religion in a quest to save the world from suffering by killing everyone on the planet. To do this, he planned to possess a colossal whale monster named Sin that rose from the depths of the ocean and decimated entire villages. The role of all summoners was to build their strength and family of Aeons to eventually confront Sin in the ruins of Xanarkin. But Sin had and would return multiple times, leaving Titus and his newfound friends to search for a way to end the destructive cycle and abolish Sin once and for all. Sid appeared as Riku's father and the leader of the Albed, a roguish lower class race. He gave the party access to the Fahrenheit, only there was no free flying in 10. 
For the first time, the overworld that had become a series standard vanished, leaving one continuous world map to pass through. While many missed running across open plains and rocketing their ships over oceans and mountains, the alternate perspective needed to disappear so developers could replace another last generation trick, pre-rendered backgrounds. Every outdoor environment in Final Fantasy X was rendered in real-time 3D, making the gorgeous surroundings stunningly tangible. You had no camera control, but the view would glide along with your movements in numerous directions. Fights were still random while traveling, but many boss encounters began with a flashy transition that blended the angle from the overworld into the brand new battle window. Fights in Final Fantasy X left active time and introduced the conditional turn-based battle. You now had all the time in the world to assign each move, and the order both sides would act in was listed in eight vertical blocks on the right of the screen. Additionally, a tip ticker scrolled vital information about each target on the top, indicating weaknesses and possible strategies. This had been previously possible as an ability or spell, but never as a tool built into the display. Only three people filled the formation, and the other four waited in the wings. You could pull them in and out at will, and they gained experience based on their involvement in each bout. If you didn't use them, they didn't level. Overdrives were the new limit break. Like before, they became available when a meter reached its full capacity. Their attacks varied per character, and like Final Fantasy VIII, many required brief bits of timed controller inputs, making use of the PS2's dual analog sticks. The big difference in X was the ability to adjust the modes of each character's overdrives, specifically identifying the circumstances that caused the meter to fill. Yuna was the only mage who could use summon magic, and instead of her callings tearing up the battlefield and fading away, they joined the party in exchange for the other two members. By her side, they drew the enemy's attacks and acted on a list of available abilities. They had a health meter for the first time, and could fall in battle, only to be resummoned for another fight. Ten's leveling system was a labyrinth of attribute plots called the Sphere Grid. As characters powered up, they gained ability points versus experience. When they achieved a new Sphere level, they could use any of the glowing orbs they found in their travels by assigning them to any node that opened up. This turned the typically stationary advancement method into a game itself, one that allowed you to go against the grain and adjust anyone's abilities to your liking. Only two equipment spaces were allotted to each character, one for weapon, one for armor but once the crafty Riku joined your party, she could customize your arsenal. Not every item could be upgraded, but the underdeveloped ones gain new abilities and often a new name when you combine them with items like marbles, spheres, and potions. The mandatory minigame in 10 was Titus and Waka's favorite pastime, Blitzball, a form of underwater rugby. After a glimpse of the professional sport in one of the opening movies, you went for the championship with the Besaid Aurochs, a good-hearted crew that had lost their first match in the tournament ten years running. Playing involved both real-time movement and turn-based combat, and once the cup was yours, you could return to the stadium whenever you wanted another challenge. As with many games in the series, Final Fantasy X was adored by some and disliked by others. Fans praised the multifaceted storyline and outstanding graphics. Skeptics detested the flawed sphere system and sometimes unbearable voiceover performances. I, I, well... But rain or shine, few missed out on the series' first installment on Sony's second system. Final Fantasy X sold close to two million units in four days. It became the first PlayStation 2 game to break that mark, and eventually sold twice that much. It's among the top 20 best-selling console games of all time, and considered one of the best role-playing games on the platform. Square seized this profitable opportunity and finally decided to release a direct sequel to a game in the numbered series. Development began in 2002 with essentially the same design staff, only at one-third the size. With the majority of locations and character models being reused from the first game, it took half the time to create. All Final Fantasies have a happy ending, giving 10 2 the most energetic opening fans had ever seen. What can I do for you? Wow, 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 wow.
Final Fantasy X-2 was released in Japan on March 13, 2003, about two years after the release of X. It eventually toured America in November. Since the major crisis in X was solved, the atmosphere of the world had a brighter, happier feel. Rather than drawing on reverend Japanese mythology, the team used popular culture, anime, and manga for inspiration. As such, the sound of the game needed to be changed as well. Noriko Matsuda and Takahito Aguchi, known for their work on The Bouncer, took over for Uematsu. Ten2 continued the story two years later, focusing on Yuna and the Gullwings, a group of ragtag sphere hunters scoring all kinds of adventure in the new, eternally calm Spira. The Gullwings were comprised of many familiar faces from Ten, and the crew traveled around the world in Sid Celsius, making Ten2 the first Final Fantasy to give you airship access from the outset. Sharing the field work with Yuna was her boisterous cousin Riku and the stolid newcomer Pain. <laughs> After continually outsmarting their rivals, the LeBlanc Syndicate, Yuna and the girls eventually stumbled across a sphere that contained some startling information. Unsure if the images were real, the Gullwings set off to uncover the truth and hopefully find Yuna's lost love. Along the way, they encountered many old friends as well as some eccentric new faces. In the two years since Sin was defeated, many new groups had risen to power. Among these, the followers of New Yevon had taken back the holy city of Bevel under the judgment of the Praetor Berylai. The Youth League had rallied many familiar troops behind the banner of the mysterious Maven Nuge, and the charismatic Albed entrepreneur Gipple got you started digging in the desert. Although Ten2 drew from a number of modern influences, the combat system relied once again on a Final Fantasy classic, job switching. However, jobs were given a fabulous makeover with the addition of dress spheres and garment grids. Garment grids were similar to very small sphere grids with two to six empty nodes. Dress spheres contained the powers of the various jobs that could be placed on the garment grids. Once equipped, the girls could freely switch between any of the dress spheres on the grid. They could only be changed with adjacent spheres, and much like the previous sphere system, passing through different gates unlocked certain temporary powers. The biggest bonus was that outfits could be changed in battle at any time, for the use of only one ability or the remainder of the fight. This made up for the lack of any additional party members beyond Yuna's Angels by allowing truly masterful characters to shine in a number of jobs. Ten2 featured several classic classes such as Warrior, Black Mage, White Mage, and Thief, it expanded the jobs Dark Knight, Gun Mage, Berserker, and Trainer, and took some liberal departures like Gunner, Songstress, and Lady Luck. Each individual dress sphere earned skills like many other job-based installments with ability points. In addition to the integration of dress spheres, Ten2 also featured a mission-based progression system rather than the traditional linear path. Although there was a main story to follow, players were given the choice to delve into more or less of it by choosing several tasks that inched the plot along or provided some other insight on the updated world of Spira. For the most part, the choices Yuna made were irreversible and had a strong impact on later parts of the story, both positive and negative. A large percentage of the game itself didn't adhere to the central plotline, which the player may have missed entirely if their focus was only on following the story. One of the most difficult decisions Yuna made early on was whether or not to side with the Youth League or New Yevon. Multiple endings were also possible depending on the percentage of the game completed. Attaining 100% prompted a bonus ending. When you reached the finale, you had the chance to start over with experienced plus characters that took with them all the items, abilities, and dress fears that you had at the previous conclusion. Only round two dropped the girls back to level one. Despite the drastic tonal change, Ten2 still had its share of notables. It was and is the only game of the core 3D incarnations that featured job switching, as well as the only game in the entire series that allowed you to swap them completely on the fly. In addition, Ten2 is the only direct console sequel in the franchise that featured faces from the original, as well as an all-female cast of playable characters.
Join us next week for the only chapter in our 13-part Final Fantasy retrospective in HD. In Part 8, Square brings its community together to journey side by side. The 11th massively multiplayer installment would connect three platforms, a dozen countries, and let the legions of fans tell their own story online.